At this time, we're going to move to uh, another formal presentation. It comes from the Executive Committee, uh, leadership from the Ad Hoc Committee, Elder <laughs> Bill Miller, Elder Raj Adikin, and Pastor Brenda Billingy, who were on the Ad Hoc Committee, and they were part of presenting to the Exec Committee the rationale of why, in light of some of the concerns you've heard from world church leaders, why we need to move forward. I'm going to ask um, Elder Miller, chairman of that committee, to come and share briefly the remarks. Elder Miller. Greetings to God's saints. As we come together today, we want to thank the Columbia Union Executive Committee for entrusting to the ad hoc committee as loyal Seventh-day Adventists of the Remnant Church as we come together for this kind of a dialogue. But we've had the privilege as well of praying together, dialoguing, and researching, and to submit recommendations to the Executive Committee. So today I will highlight just a few points. You have had the privilege of reading many of them already in the uh, visitor. It's been well stated there, so I will not uh, cover all of those areas. But I will highlight a few points of scripture, history, and the present status that could potentially be important to the discussion today. We've asked Pastor Atticon to discuss the issue of unity and authority because that was central to our discussion as well. And Pastor Brenda Billingy to discuss one's calling and how that looks within the context of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The intent of the committee was not to be a lexicon of information and arguments, but rather to make a recommendation of how best to affirm women in ministry as challenged by the North American Division and to identify major areas that should be included in this discussion. So first, looking at Scripture. We know the passage well in Joel chapter 2. Then after I have poured out my reins again, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men dream dreams and your young men will see visions. In those days I will pour out my spirit even to servants, men, and women alike. This passage, as you well know, is again referred to in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit was poured out on women and men, each empowered with gifts for the building up of the church. In the New Testament, it is clear that the gifts that Paul speaks about were not gender-specific, rather to individuals who had accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Throughout the New Testament and Scripture, there is evidence that women were church planters, apostles, deaconesses, leaders of house churches, missionary partners, evangelists, prophets, and leaders in the church, all men and women, working for the mission of Jesus Christ and the advancement of the gospel. Today, the church is also called to mission. The mission of reaching individuals with the gospel of Jesus by every means possible. I'm reminded of the words of Paul, you've read them many times, found in the book of Philippians chapter 1. It was in regard to his imprisonment when he stated, I want you to know, brethren, that what has happened to me has really turned out for the advancement of the gospel. Paul's heart and soul was about the advancement of the gospel, the mission of Jesus Christ, in whatever manner was necessary. James White said in 1860, All means which, according to sound judgment, will advance the cause of truth are not forbidden by plain scripture declarations should be employed. In Seventh-day Adventist church history, during the lifetime of Ellen White, there were many women serving in the general conference as executive secretary, treasurer, in local conferences as president, executive secretaries, treasurers, ministerial directors, departmental directors, pastors, evangelists, church planters, and more. What is interesting is that by 1950, there were no women departmental directors serving in the general conference to the local conference levels because of ordination and the secular and fundamentalist cultural view of women. As Seventh-day Adventists, we exist to advance the cause of truth by all means. This includes men and women, is also supported in our fundamental beliefs, number 14 and 17. And so a discussion that has taken place in the Columbia Union for more than 50 years has been the discussion of the role of women in ministry as it involves the advancement of the gospel and the mission of Jesus Christ. The Columbia Union has not rushed 
this process or discussion or rush, rush to the present conclusions. Example, in 1972, there was an action taken in the Columbia Union to allow qualified women to be ordained as local elders. For it was understood that for the furthering of the mission of the church, a recognition of the gifts of the Spirit in the individual, that it was theologically correct and morally and ethically responsible to take that action. This was not a practice of the world church at that time and was seen at several levels of church structure as one that would divide the church, break the unity of the church, and create widespread confusion. This earthquake did not happen. The church has remained together and is now policy. In 1984, the Columbia Union moved forward to allow women pastors as ordained local elders to baptize and perform marriages and to issue ministerial credentials and licenses. For it was understood that for the furthering of the mission of the church, a recognition of the gifts of the Spirit in the individual, that it was theologically correct and morally and ethically responsible. Again, I might state that this was not the practice of the world church. And this action was seen at several levels of church structure as one that would divide the church, break the unity of the church, and create widespread confusion. The General Conference in 1984 chose to discuss the Columbia Union actions at the Autumn Council. The following vote was taken. Columbia Union Potomac Conference requests the role of women in church. Voted to advise the Columbia Union Conference and the Potomac Conference that their request has been carefully and prayerfully reviewed by the General Conference officers. To request the Potomac Conference Executive Committee to keep tabled the issues of ministerial licenses for women and baptism by women who are in full-time pastoral work and who are also local church elders until the larger issue of women in the gospel ministry is decided by the church. They went on to state that every division would be involved with the decision and every division would set up committees to study women's ordination and would be ready to discuss the issue at the 1985 General Conference session. I quote, The decision of the 1985 General Conference session will be definitive and should be accepted as such by the church worldwide. At the 1985 General Conference session, under the voted action of ordination of women to the gospel ministry, it was voted to take no definitive action at this time regarding the ordination of women to the gospel ministry, to prepare further biblical and other studies on the question of ordaining women by assigning specific topics to scholars and theologians for research. There was no definitive answer as promised. The Columbia Union chose to support the Potomac Conference, and now women are allowed to baptize and do weddings and have ministerial licenses. The earthquake did not happen. The church has remained together, and these issues are now policy and are widely accepted in this division. The Columbia Union in 1989 endorsed the ordination of a qualified Holy Spirit gifted woman from Ohio. But they chose to wait until after the 1990 General Conference session in that they were given several assurances that women's ordination would pass. There is much debate as to the real intent of what happened in the 1990 and 1995 General Conference votes in regard to women's ordination. However, what is evident is that the votes taken did not explicitly forbid such ordination and that the church culturally was not ready to accept it at that time. The point is clear, however, each step of addressing the issue of women in ministry and women's ability to express their gifts that the Holy Spirit placed on them, as the early Seventh-day Adventist church did, were actions taken by the local grassroots constituencies and later became policies. According to church structure, this is where these decisions should be made. For the church works best when decisions are made at the proper levels as designed by the World Church. In March of 2012, the Columbia Union established an ad hoc committee to consider ways to affirm women in ministry. The committee interviewed women pastors, reviewed scriptures dealing with the issues of headship, the laying on of hands, are gifts general, or are they gender specific, the writings of Ellen White, the documentation and World Church actions about women in ministry, 
and specifically also the look at ordination of elders and deaconesses and found that in many divisions there is not organizational unity or uniformity on this issue of ordination. We reviewed the previous commission studies as authorized by the church on the theology of ordination, a biblical perspective of ordination, the history of ordination, the practice of ordination, church actions about ordination. We reviewed timeliness on women's ministry on the Seventh-day Adventist Church and the history of unity, authority, and spoke with several individuals who are part of the many discussions and votes that have been taken place over the past 40 years. We inquired of, a, of many attorneys and others about constitution and, and bylaws. We tried to cover as much as we could. What became evident was that there is a wealth of research, opinion, and misunderstandings on this issue. What has become clear is that one of our favorite pastimes as a church is to commission another study. Since the 1950s, it appears that this topic of women's ordination has received more commissional studies than any other topic. What became clear is that we are at this point not because of activity, but inactivity, waiting for the next study. What became clear to the committee is that we do not need new information, but possibly new biblical courage. The committee's research confirmed that one of the roles of the union is to help local churches and conferences to find appropriate new understandings and expressions in church life. Each time there has been movement forward for women in ministry in the present era, it was never initiated from the world church, world church policy, but from the grassroots, from the local area, most specifically the Columbia Union, and later was adopted by the World Church, but only after the movement and action at a local union. The ad hoc co committee considered the evidence of the obvious calling and spirit-filled lives of many faithful women pastors, both past and present, serving in their districts, fulfilling the mission of Jesus Christ, and advancing as Paul the gospel of Jesus Christ. Same training, a spirit filled uh, commission or calling from the same God, no evidence in scripture of gender specific spiritual gifts, yet obvious that God was and is working in them to fulfill the great commission of Jesus Christ, whether in China or in North America. For even as John Paulson, our former conference, world uh, conference president, admitted in 2009 in the context of acknowledging ordained women, he stated about China, it is clear that the Holy Spirit is a work in China. On May 17, 2012, the Ad Hoc Committee made its recommendations to the Union Executive Committee after also much prayer and debate. That the best way to affirm women in ministry, recognizing that this is a moral and ethical issue, that ordination should be to qualified individuals filled with the Holy Spirit regardless of gender, and that a special constituency should be called to consider this issue. So why call a session now and maybe not wait till 2015 or later? There are many reasons, but to name just a few. If there is a strong evidence of the Holy Spirit working through women, how long should we wait before we affirm the working of the Holy Spirit? Should policy and tradition instruct the Holy Spirit, or should the Holy Spirit instruct policy? Two. This decision of women's ordination based on the authority of the world church is the responsibility of the union. Three, the understanding that the union has a constituency and recent actions of the, of the Autumn Council that is restrictive of women serving in certain areas of church structure. Four, at the previous general conference session, a request was made to consider again the theology of ordination by a group of theologians. The process requested and the process being taken as recommended by administration and the steering committee are much different, with no reference to the issue of the ordination of women. Five, in 1975, the World Church in Session voted the approval of the ordination of deaconesses and instructed the church manual committee to make those changes. It took until 2010 to make those changes. Six, knowing that each step that has been taken to bring women back into active ministry roles has taken a specific union action. 
And knowing that it is a moral and ethical issue rooted in the word of God and spirit of prophecy, the ad hoc committee also believed that to engender good discussion, there were three areas that should contribute and continue to be discussed as we look at this issue. We must continue to prayerfully consider scripture, for it is God's word. We must look at our own history, and we must look at diversity in unity. This was reported in the June issue of The Visitor, of which you may read if you have not already read it. Dr. Bert Holoviak, who served with distinction in the General Conference archives and statistics, related the following story. Maybe you've heard it of a Miss Opal Stone, who served the church for more than 35 years with distinction. And this is her reflections on ministry. The idea is abroad that the Biblical Research Committee believes that little feeling of inequity existed among women until quite recently, that it was possibly sparked by women's lib. If that is correct, the committee has been misinformed. In earlier years, women held departmental secretary positions in local conferences. They spoke at the worship hour week after week as they visited churches. True, their reception varied. In four years as a local conference Sabbath school secretary, I learned to expect anything. But for the most part, I was accepted. I called one church elder, or I recall one church elder, who declined to sit on the same platform, but at the close of the service somewhat gruffly said, too bad you aren't a man, but come again anyway. The sad part of the inequities is that many well-qualified women have left denominational employ because of it, and some of them have kept on going all the way out of the church. Their loss? Yes. But it's a loss to the church as well. God used a woman to guide this denomination, yet women have had a hard time in this church. It seems peculiar. I've been retired now for some years. I have no bitterness. I was as fairly treated as the rest of the women. But I would like to see the present generation of women workers have a better change. Please don't believe that women were asleep all the past years and have all of a sudden awakened. Miss Opal Stone died at the age of 79 in 1973. The ad hoc committee has spent much time reviewing also the issues of unity and uniformity and authority in light of division. We have asked Dr. and Pastor Raj Atkin if he would come and speak to this issue. I have been given all of 13 minutes to tell you everything that we talked about that you need to know about unity and uh, authority in the church. So I'm going to go pretty fast here. Already used up 20 seconds. (laughs) Because we are a part of a world community, we did have to ask ourselves, will the action that we are proposing in any way jeopardize or compromise the unity of the church. As has already been said, our unity is primarily unity in Christ, who is the head of the church, who also said that he will build the church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We are united in one Lord, one faith, one blessed hope, and one mission. That is the essence of our unity. And as a church, we have made a sacred covenant to be united around a common set of beliefs and a common purpose and mission. This unity always exists, however, in diversity. We see that in the story of creation, in the story of redemption, in the birth story of the church on the day of Pentecost and the story of the final restoration, diversity is intrinsic to authentic unity. And while we desire unity, it seems to us that we make extraordinary efforts to achieve uniformity. And we do that largely by enacting policies. 
it should be news to no one that we are a highly policy-driven church, and many of these policies are directed at achieving uniformity within the body. We are also a church that is invested in the practice of collective decision-making. And there is some unifying potential in this practice, but the practice in and it, in itself does not necessarily produce unified decisions. Because we bring to the decision-making process our widely varying and sometimes unyielding perspectives that are shaped by culture, by traditions, by our tribes, by our clans, and by our heritage. In fact, we bring these perspectives even to our reading of the Bible. It is understandable then why, as a world church, we are divided in our convictions about the issue we're discussing today. In many matters, culture trumps all other considerations. Now, despite the unity that we want to maintain and the uniformity that we often strive for, the fact is that the Adventist church around the world is a very diverse community, diverse in practices and traditions and rituals and form and function and processes. The action we are considering today will no more divide the church than the scores of other actions we have taken at various levels of the church over the years that have contributed to the rich diversity that we celebrate as a world community. Over the decades, the church has demonstrated extraordinary resilience in keeping in balance its unity, its desired uniformity, and its vast diversity. Now, beside the question of unity, we also examine the question of authority. Does the Columbia Union have the authority under our governance system to authorize ordination of persons to the gospel ministry without regard to the agenda? Now, we as a denomination have had a rather winding journey in defining how authority should be exercised within the church. In the formative years of our church, our forebears leaned towards a hierarchical use of authority, so much so that by the turn of the 19th century, we realized the growing danger of concentrating power and authority at the top levels of the organization. And in our representative form of governance, authority was to rest with the people and flow up through a process of delegation. And so we adopted the practice of delegated and distributed authority. In the major reorganization that occurred at the General Conference session in 1901, we created union conferences as an intermediary between the General Conference and conferences to delegate some of the responsibility and authority that previously belonged to the General Conference. We said that the local church has authority over certain things, and the local conference, the union, and the general conference. Such boundaries were intended to keep each level of the organization functioning within its sphere of authority. Whenever one level uh, extends its reach to exert its authority over another or usurps the authority that belongs to another, it leads to this function in the organization and confusion among its people. Or when a level in, of the organization abdicates its responsibility to act in matters over which it has responsibility, it too creates dysfunction in the system. And it turns out that in our model of, of distributed authority, union conferences have been entrusted with the authority to make decisions concerning ordaining persons to the gospel ministry. The 1881 General Conference Session voted a resolution to approve the ordination of women, 1881. There is no record of Ellen White counseling against this, either before, during, or after that action. Now, that action was taken before union conferences were organized. Why, some 80 or 90 years later, after having delegated authority to the unions, 
This matter was taken up by the General Conference in the 1960s, 70s, could be an intriguing story. It appears to us that someone took it from the Union's plate and placed it on the General Conference's plate. And regardless of how that happened, that single decision seems to have shaped the trajectory of this conversation in the past 40 years. In our research, we did not find any General Conference or NAD action that revoke or limit the authority of the unions to ultimately make decisions regarding ordination. We did not find any policies limiting ordination to a certain gender or prohibiting ordination of a certain gender. And so will the Columbia Union be in, in policy violation by voting to authorize ordination without regard to gender? We do not believe so. Does the authority, the union's authority to act in the matter before us, disregard in any way a well-known statement Ellen White made to a brother A in 1875 concerning the general conference in session? She wrote, when the judgment of the general conference, which is the highest authority that God has upon the earth, is exercised, private independence and private judgment must not be maintained, but be surrendered. Whatever Ellen White meant by what she said in 1875, it is instructive to note that in 1896, she made the declaration, the boys from Battle Creek, which has been regarded as authority in counseling how the work should be done, is no longer the voice of God. Two years later, she announced, it has been some years since I have considered the general conference as the voice of God. On April 1, 1901, the day before the general conference session opened, she spoke these words, the voice of the conference ought to be the voice of God, but it is not. Since 1901, after some of the changes were made to our organization, including the creation of unions and delegating authority to them, Ellen White seems to have moderated her pre-1901 positions. For in 1909, she wrote, God has ordained that the representatives of his church from all parts of the earth, when assembled in a general conference, shall have authority. Now perhaps it is significant to note that she chose to leave out the notion of highest authority and the analogy of the voice of God. Whatever these comments were about, they were not about stripping the authority of unions conferences or congregations from the responsibilities delegated to them in our governance, governance system. The story of God's activity in mainland China is receiving a lot of attention today. While there are many differences in, social, in the social and political and religious and cultural environment between China and the global West, we cannot dismiss the significance of, of what God is doing there. It is common knowledge now that in China, ministerial ordination is extended to both men and women. I recently had the privilege of visiting seven cities in China. In my conversations with some of these ordained pastors, I was impressed that these brothers and sisters are deeply convicted that God has led them to this practice to advance his mission in mainland China. Elder Jan Paulson, after his 2009 visit to mainland China, said, It is clear the Holy Spirit is at work in China. The fact is, he said, we have at least half a dozen women pastors who are ordained as ministers in China. We recognize them as ordained ministers. There are a few more now. Now, the importance of the China story to our committee is that despite this very significant deviation in practice regarding ordination, the World Church embrace our Chinese brothers, uh, Chinese Adventists as brothers and sisters in the faith. And although we do not have organizational reach into mainland China, we recognize them by including them in the Seventh-day Adventist yearbook, we include their numbers in our membership statistics 
for the China Union Mission, the North Asia Pacific Division, and for the General Conference. In his recent visit to China, Elder Wilson graciously assured the assembled Chinese Adventists, you are a vital part of God's worldwide people who are moving towards the second coming of Christ. The question to which I think the answer is obvious is this. If the practice of ordaining women is a violation of a biblical teaching or of a theological principle or of a fundamental tenet of the Adventist faith or is in any way immoral, illegal, divisive, or unchristian, would we so heartily and unconditionally embrace Chinese Chinese Adventists as Adventists when they unapologetically ordain women pastors. Think about it. What if one day soon we gained administrative access to mainland China and were able to extend our policies and regulations to them? Will we promptly revoke all these ordinations to bring them in line with the rest of the world body, or will we celebrate the diversity that God has brought about? And so in light of these factors, we conclude as a committee that the action today by this body to approve the ordination of persons of the gospel ministry without regard to gender is within the rightful purview of this body and to wait for another level of the organization to address it would be to abdicate our responsibility and privilege. We conclude that the World Church at at multiple GC sessions and annual council sessions has amply demonstrated its inability to act decisively in this matter. And we have no evidence that the regional and cultural biases have changed on this subject. We conclude that our action does not intrude upon or usurp the authority of any other level of the organization, but respects our collective commitment to delegated and distributed authority. We conclude that it is not a violation of any biblical teaching or theological principle. We conclude that gender-based discrimination in ministerial ordination is a practice that we must not condone any longer in this union. We conclude that the action we are proposing is the morally and ethically right thing to do, and the right time to do the right thing is right now. And now invite uh, Pastor Brenda Bellingy, pastor of the Metropolitan Church uh, in this area, to share your testimony. In the book of Acts, there's a devout man called Cornelius, obviously called by God. The Bible says he feared God, he gave alms, he prayed, and he shared his faith. Peter was selected to travel to Caesarea to evaluate this Gentile, although a bit skeptical about what he might witness. When he got there, he was amazed that Cornelius was actually chosen appointed, and had similar evidence, the speaking of tongues, just like they had experienced. And his summary evaluation was, surely no one can refuse water to these Gentiles. If God gave them the same gift he gave us, who was I to think that I could oppose God? Now, similarly today, You have been selected to travel to Silver Spring to conduct an evaluation. And you might be a bit skeptical about what you might witness today. But the real question on the table is simply, should female pastors be ordained? As in the book of Acts, God brought you face to face with Cornelia, a living example a humble vessel willing to be used by God. 
and prayerfully the evidence will assist us in making the right decision today. But first, let's clarify, what is ordination? Glad you asked. Three simple things for me regarding ordination. A call, confirmation, and celebration. And the order is important because without a call, there can be no celebration. Without the celebration, no confirmation. God is in the business of calling and celebrating with his children. I'm going to share with you today what I consider to be part of my calling. And you get to do the evaluation process regarding the call. Now first, I would like you to note that in the call, there are three things, as mentioned, the confirmation and the celebration. And in the book of John 15, 16, it states, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you, which means appointed, so that you should go and bear fruit. The call of God involves three things, choosing, anointing, producing, C-A-P. And I'd like you to notice that the calling cap is given by God. It is his calling, it is his decision, and how awesome is it? What a wonderful privilege that God allows humans to confirm and celebrate those he has called to ministry. Now that you've been reminded of your role today, let's proceed to the evaluation. My name is Brenda Langford Billingy. I am employed in full-time ministry with the Great Allegheny East Conference of Seventh-day Adventists since the year 2000. The question is, do I wear the cap? The choosing, the anointing, the producing. I'll let you decide. First, C, the choosing. Specifically, selecting someone and in giving them an invitation from God to go to a specific place and accomplish a specific purpose. I found myself as a well-groomed, grounded financial aid director hearing a call from God, not knowing what I should do with it, but fearing God rather than man I knew I needed to be obedient to the call. At the end of the day, I know I need to give account to God regarding his call. So I brought with me a portfolio of places I have been called to preach. It's too much to even bring up front. To Australia, to Africa, to New Zealand, to St. Croix, to Jamaica, to Trinidad, and the list goes on and on and on. Men are chosen to carry the gospel to every nation. Are women chosen as well? If I were completing your evaluation of me, Cornelia, today, based on the evidence, I would definitely check yes, there is choosing. But then there's the A, the anointing and the appointing. That's the ability and the gifting that God provides in order to accomplish his purpose. I remember at the service that was supposed to be my commissioning service that God did something special for me on that day. We were all kneeling on the same platform, men and myself. And as we said the prayer, I smelled something that was very, very soothing and fragrant. 
I realized that one gentleman, probably commissioned by God, was anointing me during the service, secretly and privately. That anointing, I think, God honored. Because in 2008, I was appointed to be the senior pastor of the Metropolitan Church in Hyattsville, Maryland, a church with over 1,100 membership strong. We completed recently a $7 million project and refinanced that to an interest rate from 6.5 to 3.5. We were the first in the area to establish an excellent, excellent media department to the point where we received at the end of the year Metro, uh, sorry, Praise Vision commendation for the highest online streaming of our church services on the internet. We've recently begun a television ministry. We've done three grants for food distributions in our community and for baby blessings of anyone in the community who would like to do so. But I have to share with you that the greatest appointment that I think I have received from my church was highlighted in 2010. Most of you would have gotten this visitor magazine. And it shares with you here my appointment from the World Church to stand and represent the World Church. My question today is, will the World Church stand and represent me? Based on the evidence, if I were completing the evaluation today of me, Cornelia, I would definitely check yes for anointing. But then there's the P, the P in the cap. There's the choosing, the anointing, but the producing is important. Producing is successful implementation of his desired purpose. God's desired purpose. In 2011, Metropolitan Church had the highest baptism in our conference. Over 150 souls baptized. We have grown to be the second largest congregation in our conference. We have also shared this past year the highest tithe increase. We do have the largest church campus, housing our church, a school that has doubled in size, a ministry center, and a senior citizens building that's full to capacity. And I also have to share with you that my joy and pride is that I have a young man, a young adult, who shares as my associate pastor and the reason that as male and female, God could use us to produce that much is because we see no distinction in who we are and how we function. We simply focus on the task of evangelism and bringing souls into the kingdom. Based on the evidence, if I were completing your evaluation of me today, I definitely would check yes for producing. But for fear that someone would leave this gathering with the impression that I'm just a proud, boastful female pastor, let me hasten to add that it is God's calling. It is God's anointing. It is God's producing. Without him, we are nothing. Therefore, it is in recognition of God's enabling power that I do believe, like Peter today, you can truly declare on your evaluation that no one should refuse women. If God gave them the same gift that he gave to men, then who are we? 
Who are we to oppose God? And I can hear someone's silent question. What exactly are we refusing? Well, I'm glad you asked. Ordination is a graduation of sorts. And three things are important in a graduation. A cap, a gown, and a diploma. As soon as it is evident that coursework has been completed, caps and gowns are ordered and picked up. Now we have looked at the evidence, and you would agree that even though I am a female pastor, there is a choosing and there is an anointing, and there is producing. So I'm sure you won't mind me wearing the cap. But no graduation is complete just with cap and with gown. The gown, of course, represents the grace of God the grace that allows us to do what we do, not because we are worthy, but because God is able. We have a cap and we have a gown, but no graduation is complete without a diploma. And no diploma is valid without precise wording. If the diploma mistakenly states that I earned an MA degree when I completed coursework for an MED degree, I would need to then turn in the incorrect diploma and have it redone so that the community in which I function can be certain of what I'm qualified to do. It is also a natural expectation that the president the faculty and the staff of the university will share in that celebration. A similar process holds true for ordination. Three things are important. The cap, the calling, the anointing, and producing. The gown of God's grace, because t'was grace that brought me and taught me and led me and fed me. It was only grace. But you also need to know that we do need a diploma, one with precise wording, not made up words, not substituted words like commissioned, but a word that declares to the community that this person is qualified to meet the needs of that community. So what is the word? So very glad you asked. It's the same word for a Jew as it is for a Gentile. It's the same word as a male for a female. For with God, there is no distinction. Ordination, you are called and ordained. And what God has capped and covered, let no man fail to confirm and celebrate. Micah 3 is addressed to the rulers of the house of Israel. Amid their negative behavior, he states, I have three things, power, justice, and courage. And the question is today, amidst all the negative that you might have heard over this subject for the past weeks and months and years, do you have three things today? And you know what they are. It is what God requires of you justice, kindness, humility, for your daughters are going off to college, some of them with a hidden call to ministry in their hearts, and they are too scared to accept it and to be obedient to it because they don't know how their church would react to it. Today, as you vote, vote for those daughters, vote for the 130 female seminarians who are still studying and soon to experience graduation. 
they are expecting that their church, the Seventh-day Adventist church, will do the right thing as it relates to the ordination process and grant them their diploma. Do it, vote for it for the sake of the 20 female pastors already in the union whom I stand to represent today. The ones who are already qualified and wearing their caps and gowns, but patiently extending their hands in hopes of receiving the correct diploma, confirming their qualifications while praying in their hearts that leadership will cheer in their celebration. Vote today, vote for God's sake, for it is his calling, it is his anointing, it is his producing in his children. And the reality is, it's not about us. And it's not about you. It's about Jesus. It's about his desire that no one should perish. So to fulfill that desire, he has promised that in these last days, he will pour out his spirit upon all flesh, sons and daughters. We are all ordained to go and preach to every nation. People are dying. Others are searching. Children are suffering. It's time to stop debating, for our Lord is coming, and he is much closer than we think. My prayer today is that as you vote, based on the evidence of God's calling, that will, you will allow God's spirit to completely stir your hearts, get rid of self, and allow God's spirit to work amongst us, not for our benefit, but for the benefit of the world that awaits to hear the good news of God. I brought today my commissioning diploma. I will leave it on the table in hopes that as you vote today, I will be able, on behalf of myself and all the women looking even on the internet, to see our president today sign his name on this diploma and probably choose to put an X over the word commissioning and write in the word ordained. All heaven awaits your vote.